Welcome everyone for uh, joining us on our uh, webinar today, Navigating the Complexity of White Space. Uh, my name's John Barclay, I'll be your facilitator for today. Our colleague Tony will also be uh, joining me. Today we're going to do something a little bit differently with this one. We wanted to take the opportunity to really have a discussion about what white space is and have a discussion around some of the complexities of white space while also talking about some of the, uh, the key attributes we can use to navigate white space. So it's a terminology we're using to define a certain part of the process so we really look forward to taking you through that. Uh, so as I said, my name is John Barclay, I'm the founder at Barclays. Here at Barclays we help leaders become better leaders and our goal is to provide everyone with the tools and the understanding they need to become the best leaders possible. And these webinars are designed to give you the insight to some of these key areas and, uh, and we look forward to sharing today's with you and the ones in the future. So Tony, do you wanna give us a bit of your background please? Thanks John, morning everybody. My name's Tony Whitcomb, I'm the Director of Consulting at Barclays. So my role is to sort of provide consultants to help uh, organizations uh, improve their performance and again, help them, uh, their leaders become better leaders. All right, thanks Tony. All right, so look, let's get into it. As I said before, we're going to try and do something a little bit different. We're not going to necessarily present a presentation nope. today. No. Nope. Uh, we're going to sort of use the presentation that you can see to guide our discussion and give you some un understanding around white space. So the first place we're going to start is talking about the levels of culture maturity. Because when we're talking about white space, we are talking about culture and we're yep. talking about people and behaviours and, and uh, the way things move. So. Talk us through this representation, Tony, of the aeroplane circling around the current planet of a reacting culture. Organisations spend a lot of time uh, sort of trying to change their culture and their cultural maturity. And so therefore, they're, you know, they're generally pretty active, uh, the, the, but they often find themselves running around or flying around in the same sort of space. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we're trying to sort of uh, help organisations realise is that they need a different type of craft to be able to move through the cultural maturity uh, levels. An aeroplane is great for a certain type of activity and it's great for a certain type of, pro uh, of, of motion, mm. but this is different motion, this is different processes that they're trying to, to sort of break out of and the aeroplane doesn't, maybe doesn't cut it. And all that happens is they constantly circulate around the same world, that are operating at the same level, but they never break through the boundary or the barrier that, that allows them to move into the next level of cultural maturity. Yeah, so it allows them to move within different attributes of a reacting culture, yep. some better than others, yep. but fundamentally not necessarily breaking through to the next level of maturity. Yeah, they, they, they can't break out through that level into the next level and the levels beyond. Yeah, so they're not necessarily using the right mechanism for creating the change. They're actually using a process in place that actually allows them to move around but not necessarily get the breakthroughs that they're, yep. that they're looking yep. for. The travel mechanism is there, it's just maybe doesn't have the right level of power to break through into the next level of maturity. Yeah. So when we look through those levels of maturity, so we've got a reacting culture, we've got the conforming culture, we've got an achieving culture, and we've got the integral culture. Yep. Yeah, and then moving into that totally new world. Um, so what's the representation of then the white space between each stage? The, the white space is effectively the, the challenges that the organisations have to tackle to get from one cultural maturity level to the next. The reason we sort of refer, we call it white space is it's blinding in terms of its sort of uh, the way it represents itself. Yeah, people can't see what the next stage of the journey is. They can't see what the next challenge is that they face. Um, so you end up with this white blindness that you often get when you're you're sort of faced with I'm not sure what it is that I need to do next. Mm -hmm. When people when the organisations get into white space, things become a little bit clearer because the things that are in the white space environment are things that they're probably they've had some experience with before or they've got some familiarity. They're maybe just not quite sure about what that means in that particular context or that particular part of the journey. Yeah. But we represent it as a whiteness because of the fact that it is so blinding and it's between every individual cultural maturity layer, as you can see in the diagram, there's a, yeah. there's a boundary of white space between each of the layers. Yeah, there's always an element, once you step out of what the way we do things now to the way we want to do things in the future, there's always this space in between that's unknown. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the it's that sort of that the, the fear of leaping into something that that's not quite clear. Mm. 
And what we, you know, hopefully through today's webinar, people get a chance to see what we mean by that stepping out and stepping into the unknown and stepping into that blinding space. Yep. Um, because that's what we actually have to do to get through the change. You know, circling around the same attributes doesn't move us through the maturity curve. Organisations can can look and can be very, very busy. Mm -hmm. Lots of businesses that I'm sure we've all worked in have been very, have worked really, really hard at changing culture. Yeah. So the aeroplane's moving constantly and it's churning up lots and lots of miles and everybody feels as though they're extremely active. Because they're moving. But they're, and they are moving, but they never actually, they bump up against the atmosphere and they can't get through. They, they, yeah. they reach their ceiling height, the aeroplane gets to a point where it can't go any further. And what happens is it bounces off and drops, drops back down again. Yeah. And, and so they're just constantly moving in the same, the same maturity level without actually making any, any change to get them through into the next level. Yeah. So fundamentally, we've got to change the mechanism that we yep. drive through. So going from an aeroplane to a rocket ship, for example, yep. and that's a representation of having the right strategy to push through each stage of change. Yes. It, it requires a different philosophy or a different uh, process. Therefore, it requires different tools, and the, the rocket ship is a representation of the fact that we need a different, pro a different way of doing it. All right. Well, let's go through the rest of this and unpack what we mean by the rocket ship and what we mean by white space and see what other pe see what we can explain from that. So another way of representing it that people may be familiar with, so that's showing all the different levels of maturity, but fundamentally it comes from A space, where we are now, our current state, yep. beliefs, feelings, values, behaviours, norms, mm -hmm. to <clears throat> we've defined a new state, a B space, that mm -hmm. this is where we want to be, so that might have some new values, some new beliefs, new behaviours, new norms. Mm. The space in between is what we call white, the white space. space. Yep. And what's the important things for people to be considering when we actually start thinking about going through white space? So I think there's, there's the, uh, a number of uh, elements. So there's some familiarity with white space once people get into it. It's not completely alien, it's not completely new world, it's just recognising what, what, what things they're actually going to face and, and maybe some element of understanding about the things that are more important to do in the early phases. Yeah. So that the fact that, they, that nobody wants to approach a, a journey without having a clear view of what does the map look like, what's the journey plan. How do I know where, whether I'm on the right track or not? So you know, we use the sort of GPS as an indication of the fact that organisations need a plan. They need yeah. to understand the track that they that they're intending to follow, right? knowing yeah. that it's never going to be the perfect plan uh, all the way through, and that the the organisation has to have the ability to be able to adapt yeah. to the changing circumstances. So, so, like any GPS, when you're actually travelling, it will identify that there's a you know. A detour. Mm. You've actually got to change direction and you've got to move. Yep. Traffic on the road, no, there's a there's a crash, you need to change it and you need to plot a different route. It gives you different alternative routes and the plan needs to be flexible enough to find the route, the bypass around. But you've got to know your current state, your future state, navigate it, yep. plan it out, yep. and get on the journey. That's right. Start the journey. When you're on the journey, you'll come across things that you may well be have some familiarity with, and we're representing those as asteroids. So these are known hazards, things yeah. that you know that are going to be present. Maybe you're not quite sure where they are or when they're going to appear in the journey, but you've got some understanding about what the hazard is like and how it, how it yeah. operates or reacts, and some degree of understanding about a strategy or strategies to be able to tackle, challenge, or resolve the hazard. Because they normally show up in similar circumstances. Yeah. They're in a similar routine. They're on an orbit. They generally show up in certain situations, certain types of tasks, certain types of roles. Yes. So you can. Th there's an element of predictability with yeah. those. You can predict when you might choose, when you might see them on your journey, yeah. and therefore get in, get ahead of those, and mm. put some plans together to be able to tackle those when they appear. Yeah. Versus black holes. Black, now black holes are a completely different story. Um, and, the, the, the analogy of the black hole is that, that that has a tendency to draw everything in. It's a it's something that sucks lots and lots of issues, lots and lots of resource, lots and lots of time and effort mm -hmm. into a single process or a single point. Yeah. And once you get caught in the, the, the sort of beam of a, of a black hole, when you're caught in that gravity, it's really hard for an organisation to pull itself out yeah. and it tends to draw in everything that surrounds it. 
for, often with black holes you don't see them coming because you can't you know, they're not quite so obvious as asteroids so they're a little bit more difficult to, to, to work out what, what they are and where they're going to be but when you come across them it's you no know, it's it's sort of a, it's, it can be an extremely challenging process to be able to get out of the black hole yeah so fundamentally, is the white space is the is the change process that we go through. There's yeah. got to be a plan to navigate that change. It's identifying the obstacles you're gonna mm. predictably um, um, come into contact with along the way. Yep. And have strategies for them, mm. but also identifying some of those black holes that and culturally that can be just the way we do things in the A space that we're trying to remove, mm. and you can go into the white space be drawn back into those. Yep. We, we can use some of our sort of uh, historical knowledge or some of our understanding to predict some of the black holes that could be present. Mm. So at least then you can be prepared from a strategy point of view. Yeah. The challenge with black holes is you're never quite sure when they're going to appear. Right, so when we actually start thinking about, well, to get into this, what do we need to do? Mm. You know, let's actually start thinking about going from A to B. What's the main things that we need to start understanding? Organisations need to have a good understanding of what their atmosphere is like. So you know, the graphic represents the sort of the typical things that will be already likely to be present in the organisation that they'll have some understanding of, or may well, or, or they may well not have an understanding, but it gives them an indication of something they need to get an understanding from. Yeah. The challenge in this space is that you know, lots of things up there are uh, will probably already have some some data or some measures. Yeah. The challenge here is trying to make sure that they are all connected together and all linked. That they've been done with a, with a, a commonality or common, common purpose so that, that you can actually use the, the, the information that that pro provides collectively rather than it being, uh, rather than the information not actually giving you a complete or full picture. Yeah, because I mean most organisations, so first one up there is the culture. Yep. Right? Most, most organisations, not all, but most organisations have done some form of culture survey, culture diagnostic, get an understanding of their culture. Yeah. But it's probably been done independent of any leadership assessment or any leadership yeah. behavioural um, understanding. Mm -hmm. It's probably been done in isolation to the way the systems are functioning. Mm -hmm. It's probably been done in isolation to what we're measuring. And all those other checks and balances have probably been done in isolation of all the others as well. Yeah, and, and that sort of approach means that it's it can be quite hard to pick up the, the true common themes and the true common issues that the organisation needs to work on as they work their way through their cultural maturity journey. Yeah. And some of that can actually be quite conflicting where they may end up in a situation where the organisation has two completely different sets of data that actually are giving them completely opposite views. Mm. Um, so there's some challenge here in terms of working out where they actually are in their in their A space environment. Yeah, what's going on around them in their A space that they need to navigate through. Yep. Yep. So I guess the learning here for everyone when it comes to navigating white space to discover it is you've got to look at everything together, not in isolation of, yep. of, of each other. So what do we know about the culture? What do we know about our leaders? What do we know about our, our frontline workforce? What do we know about our systems? Mm. What do we know about our exposures? What do we know about our performance indicators and our KPIs you know, and how they're all interacting together? There's a real advantage in doing that as a collective exercise. Mm. Um, and it can be as big or as small as it needs to be, but yeah. there's some real advantage in doing that as a collective exercise rather than doing it as a series of single exercises over a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, you know, time, cost, and, and, and sort of thematic advantage to that. Yeah, definitely. So discovering your white space is the first step. Yep. So define your A space, B space, know that there's that space, mm. and then get all the information you can to actually understand what's going on in there. Yep. Right. So we talk about the integral model being the overarching way of you know growing to become into the new culture, the most mature culture. Mm. So give us a bit of background about the integral model. What does it mean and how does it fit into the concept of white space? Wilbur uh, sort of developed the integral model uh, many years ago and yeah. as a way of trying to get an understanding of, of the entirety of things. So you know, he used it as a holistic model to try and understand how, how the world operates. And each of the individual quadrants can be thought of as an individual uh, world in itself. So he called them a whole one. Uh, so individually, you know, that, could be the, that could be the world. Or collectively, they work in tandem to form a, an entire picture of the world. And you can see from the model, it's sort of split into a vertical and, and horizontal uh, sort of sense. 
the, the, the vertical ones, and particularly the ones on the left-hand side, are the ones where organisations have often the most difficulty. It's the things that people are aware that are there, but they can't see. Um, so that's it, it's the intangible elements that people, uh, that the individuals have, and that they're often internal. So a simple example of this that maybe people understand is gravity. Yeah. So people understand that gravity exists, but they can't, can't see, see it. it. What they see is the representation of gravity. If you drop something, you're actually seeing the effect of gravity on the object, not gravity itself. But everybody knows that gravity is there. So the same as behaviour. We can see the behaviour, but yep. we can't necessarily see the thoughts and the feelings and the intentions that are coming up behind it. Exactly. And that's we what make a lot of assumptions of those. We do. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that, that's the difficult area from an organisational point of view, is trying to un understand and unpick that. Yeah. On the right-hand side, the, the sort of external uh, process, it's behaviour and systems. And those are things which people and organisations can see very easily and very clearly. Yeah. And therefore, those, those are things that often get measured really, really well. Yeah. Um, and the, the challenge with the uh, with organisations and the beauty of the integral model is it tries to integrate both of those things together to give a complete picture and a complete um, solution. And, and what you often find organisations do is they'll spend some time understanding possibly where they're at, um, what, what leaders and indicators have they got that tells them where they're at. But then what they do is that the solutions of that then tend to only fit in one element of the, bottom, of, of the quadrant and often it sits in the systems sense. Yeah. They spend a lot of time layering, layering, layering the systems when the issues are behavioral or cultural. Yeah. Um, and the, the model is great because it gives you an opportunity to be able to ensure that your findings and your actions can be tailored together. So understanding the journey, when we just focus in on systems, which is the most common, yeah. at best you're in the reactive conforming style maturity culture anyway because you're not considering the cultural the behavioral and the intentional yeah. so the white space in change is actually about getting alignment between the individual and the collective mm -hmm. but also working through and embracing the understanding of both the subjective and, and the objective mm -hmm. It's it's aimed or it, it's the, the beauty of this model is it, it gives you the opportunity to have a holistic solution, as well as understanding the holistic the issue from a holistic sense the solutions can be holistic too, yeah. which gives organisations the better opportunity and the better degree of success in moving from one level of cultural maturity to the next. Yeah, so it's about being integral in your approach. Yep, right. that's right. All right, well let's keep let's keep unpacking. Let's start looking at it from an individual point of view and this is probably something that's going to start looking familiar for people now I think once we get into here this is where people start to go oh I start to see the connection between what we're talking about in regards to the unknown yeah. and what we're regards to the blindness of it because mm. we can't necessarily feel or see it but people might be familiar with the idea of comfort zone and get outside of your comfort zone you know this is where people learn this is where people grow and this is how change happens so yeah. You know, we've got to get outside our comfort zone or we're doing the same thing. Mm. So in this case, of that original maturity is just orbiting around the planet. Yep. Staying in our comfort zone, you know, in our atmosphere. Out. That's right. Yeah. Right. And that's where people feel safe. Mm. That's where people feel comfortable and yep. where people feel in control. Mm. So the minute we step out of that, that's what we call white space. And the minute we've got to do something different and the minute we've got to try and embrace something or let go of something else that we've done before... Mm. That's the unknown, that's the white space, because that's where we start to lose that level of control, we start to feel unsafe, we start to feel unsure. Yep. So that's that process of going through the white space. And why is it important for the individuals to acknowledge the fact that that's what's happening? I, I think people never grow if they don't get out of the zone that they're in. You've got to get out of your comfort zone into a... A, you know, an uncomfortable zone because the uncomfortable zone allows you to start learning and getting new experiences. Yeah. The white space is just a representation of this is the uncomfortable part of, of, the, of the cultural change journey. When you're in there, yes, you're feeling unsafe unless you're feeling unsure. And importantly, you know, there is a sense of a loss of control because you're not in the same environment that you were in before. Mm. But people have to, become, have to become comfortable with the fact that they're going to be, they're going through a change journey. Yeah. And there is a potential that they're going to fail mm. um, in that process. And, and, and here, the key thing is that individuals need to recognize that they're going to fail. So fail quick and fail early. Yeah. Learn the, uh, take the learnings from the failure process 
turning into the next set of, of experiences and get through this white space zone as quickly as they can because then they get into the learning process where they get they get greater comfort in being able to learn new skills. So the comfort zone grows, the learning opportunities grow, the problem solving starts yeah. to happen. Yeah. So when we move through white space as a learning process, you know, like I say, safe to fail, fail fast, learn fast. Mm. That allows you to get into the learning stage because once you get into that learning stage and you start problem solving, overcoming challenges, um, it's starting to feel a little bit more comfortable in this new space, that's when the growth shift can happen. Yes, and, and the, ex the growth accelerates quite rapidly through that process because you've got through the early uncomfortable stage and now you're in that sort of testing, exploring and, and becoming more comfortable with the testing and exploring yeah. process. Yeah, because I mean that's that's the point of what from A space to B space is about. There's a whole heap of uncertainty, and then there's a whole heap of learning, mm -hmm. and then once you get into that B space, that's where the growth is starting to yeah. really and, happen. And that's where your opportunity becomes. Mm -hmm. There's a whole host of opportunity that that, it, that sort of extends and expands as you get through this, this this learning journey. Well, let's have a look at the same context, but from an organisational point of view. So, how does it how does this translate then from individual to or, organisational? Organisations need to, what need to recognise that organisationally they're going through the same process. The organisation's made up of, of groups people. of individuals yeah. that so experience it individually. I think the key thing for the organisation is to recognise that they are going through a, a, a white space process as well, where they're mm -hmm. going to lose control, where the organisation feels a little bit unsafe and unsure, mm -hmm. um, and they have to create the environment that allows people to fail safe, fail safely, fail quickly, fail early and just pick themselves up, dust themselves off and, and, and yeah. go again. Yeah. Without you know, the opposite of that, it, it, the environment that's created that's, that's the opposite of that will not allow individuals or organisations to grow. Yeah. So they've got to recognise that that's the level of uncomfortableness that they're going to be in, yeah. is that they're, they're, they're feeling that they're losing a little bit of control yeah. um, and that, you know, resisting the temptation to try and claw that control back without allowing individuals to grow and to yeah. learn fast enough. And the critical bit here is actually understanding what we're talking about here is all on the subjective, the left side of yep. that the model. Because we know what we can see, mm -hmm. we know what we can tangibly put in place around systems and checklists and programs. Mm -hmm. But this is now actually addressing the fact that how do people feel to get the change you want? Yeah. And how do we actually progress through that space so they can learn mm -hmm. and they can grow? And that just increases the level of uncomfortableness from an individual and from an organisational point of view, particularly at, at a leader level, yeah. because leaders are you know, there to lead, so they're used to having the ability to be able to lead and control things. Yeah. In this organisational change where you're going through these cultural maturity levels, you lose the ability uh, to be able to do that quite so effectively or quite so well for a period of time. And that can be quite confronting for, for leaders. Yeah. And, but again, it's recognizing that you're on the left-hand side of the model, of the integral model, and you've got to be comfortable to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. to allow you to progress through that and into a situation where you get back some of the more familiar things around you know, the sort of uh, the, the, the act, behaviors and measures that you would have had in place previously. They may be different as you got through cultural maturity levels, but you get back some of those, those more comfortable feelings that you've had previously. Because I mean, fundamentally that left side, you've got the collective group of individuals mm -hmm going through that yep. change and their level of uncertainty, their level of feeling unsafe, collectively feeling like they're losing a bit of control mm. versus just the individual themselves maybe having to have a bigger version of that or yes. for some individuals a smaller version of that mm. based on wherever their starting point is. Yeah, I mean, culture works in both sides, but that sort of the cultural level element is relevant in both parts of the yeah. left-hand side, you know, the individual and collectively. But that's obviously where the cultural part of the process is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's getting comfortable with the fact that that's, that's the bit of the change process that leaders will struggle with, mm -hmm. in, in sort of my view, because they're not quite, as, quite as comfortable with that part of the model. Yeah. Well, let's keep moving through. So let's look at why people may struggle to move outside their comfort zone or why, or why organisations might struggle to take that step outside their comfort zone. So why they stay comfortable in just circling their own world. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the key things that we've identified that organisations struggle to take that first step with? I think what the, some of the early struggles are around just the sheer recognition of the fact that there's a need for change, particularly if, if the organisation's performing well. You know, they may well have had 
regular years of success over a you know, reasonably long period of time and, yeah. and so therefore they may not necessarily recognise either that there is a need for them to change or that the opportunity that the change will present if they could move their organisation to the next level of cultural maturity. So it's just been comfortable enough in the current performance rate rather than actually sitting back and seeing what's possible? Yeah, it's, it's not realising where they could be mm. if they actually moved up into a different level of cult, mm. a cultural level. And that's that common cognitive bias stuff that goes on, isn't it? I yeah. mean, most organisations hold strong to some of the attributes that go on and what has led to a certain level of success. It, because the, it leads on to the sort of next one, which is about the fear of change. Mm. Um, you know, change in itself is, a, is a, a, a challenging process and it's not without the potential for things to go wrong. And mm. you know, as we said earlier, organisations have to be comfortable with, being, with the potential for failure. Mm. But the fear of change also has an element of it, particularly if the organisation's been relatively successful. If we change, does that mean that we keep the level of success that we've got? And that yeah. in itself is, a, is, a, is enough of a fear factor for some organisations. You think about some of the activities you get into with leaders on site, you know, I mean, just changing the function of when I go to site, the first thing I do is go to all the paperwork and make sure it's all filled out properly yeah. and everything else, which is probably heavily conforming and systems orientated versus don't even worry about the paperwork. I didn't worry about the system. Just go and actually have a conversation yeah. with people. Yeah. That fear of change, that, well, hang on, me making sure my systems are working has got me this far. Yep. I don't want to have to change that. That's what's happening now. Mm. And that gives them a certain level of success, mm. but it stops them from getting the greater level of success as they get through the levels of cultural maturity. And that's what we mean by just letting go of that. Yeah, some things... No, it, but leaders have got to be comfortable to let go of some of the things that are actually holding them back yeah. and part of this is working out what those things are and then, be, and then generating the environment where that comfort level is such that they can let go and probably the most common one I mean, well those are pretty common too but the other one we hear a lot about is just timing I'm just too busy right now to embrace yeah. a change process we're always going to be too busy. Organisations yeah. are always busy because there's always something to do. You wouldn't be in business if no. you didn't have stuff to do. Exactly. And <laughs> so it's about recognising what's where am I spending my time and what are the urgent or important things for me to do. Mm. We could all fill our day full of work mm. and yet still not necessarily generate the right level of benefit, value or performance that we need either as an individual mm. leader or as an organisation. And, and yeah, this is the other one too where it's really important to understand that we might be busy being busy, and that might be a part of the cultural problem. Yep, yeah, it could be. No, again, sometimes activity in itself is not enough to, to create change, and mm -hmm. no, nobody wants to be seen not to be contributing to organisations. So we can all find ways of keeping ourselves active, but it isn't necessarily leading to the betterment of the business by by changing the the, the, the cultural levels. And, and safety cultures, we've all seen that. We're doing a million programs, we're doing lots of different things, and we're busy running, doing all this stuff. Yeah. But what's it really? What's is it, it really yeah. contributing? Is to? it achieving? Is it making the change that, that the business or the individual leaders want or expect it to? Um, and and uh, that leads on to I guess the next one uh, in terms of resources. Similarly, with time, you know, organisations either say that they, ne they don't have enough resource mm -hmm. and we never know it. Organisations will never have enough resource necessarily to do everything they want. Yeah. But it's also about the right type of resource and, and what's that, has that resource got the abilities or the wherewithal to be able to help the change process? Mm -hmm. you know, an organisation is, is created to do a certain type of thing. You know, they're, they're in hospitality or they're in transport, transport they're in medical or they're in resources or construction. Work, yeah. They're there to build things or to make things or to produce things or to mm -hmm. provide a service. They're maybe not necessarily there to develop and evolve and drive leadership change or yeah, culture, culture change, change or programs. Personal development. Personal development. So it's about recognising that in embarking on these journeys, it's, it, part of the key things is to engage with the right type of organisation who've got the right side of resources to help them transition through the journey that they, that yeah. they want to be on. And the other one is just sometimes clarity. What is B space? Yeah. Do, do we even know what it is? Can we describe it? Do yeah. we know what it looks like? Because yeah. if we can't do that, how do we expect the rest of the organisation to be able to get there? Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to take a first step to somewhere you don't know you're going. Yeah. So just we have stay, to be able to stay where picture. we are. That's right. It's yeah. easier to stay where we are. All right. So look, you know, there's other things too when we talk about white space. And while it's necessarily doing some new things, more often than not, it's trying new things that 
you know, that may be uncomfortable and make us feel a little bit unsure. Sometimes it's letting go of stuff too. Yeah. Slogans, for example, is a big one that, you know, people struggle with what that's about. I mean, Zero Harm itself, as an example here, has been driven by our core value of not wanting to hurt people. Yep. All right? So people have tried to find a way to articulate a message mm. to say we don't want to hurt people ever. Mm. So that means we want zero harm. But what's some of the struggles with that when it comes to culture maturity? I, I think it, it, it tends to lead to a certain type of action or activity that, that can detract away from the value and, and it engineers organisations into a space where they struggle to, to move culturally into a different level. Yeah. No, I don't, uh, the, the value is very, very uh, strong and it's, it's the right sort of value. It's just the way that people have interpreted that yeah. and what they've then done to try and demonstrate or deliver the value. Mm. And that in itself can be something that, that needs to be unpacked and disconnected so that the value stays strong and stays there. But they, you know, the, so the left hand side is looked at it on, on the integral model. They look at it in a slightly different way, mm. and that means that the the, the right hand side, which covers the behaviours and the systems process, can change to allow the value to be delivered, but differently. Yeah. Still keep the value. We're just doing it in a different way. Yeah, and the unintended outcome of something like zero harm, for example, is the longer we go without harm, the more we can potentially fall back into a reactive culture. Yeah. So why do I need to change anything or why do I need to keep evolving because you know, we've gone weeks or months without harm, we must be perfect, we must be right. You run the risk of staying in that conforming reactive culture even though you're trying to drive a values-based message. And that's some of the, you know, those are some of the examples of some of the actions or behaviours that, are, that, are, that come out of having that value in the way that it is painted as a value without necessarily mm -hmm. giving the business or the organization opportunity to grow culturally because yeah. it's an underpinning value but it's a lag yes. it's lagging it's, lagging. it's outcome orientated mm -hmm. it's an absolute yep. it's a very difficult message to articulate correctly culturally mm -hmm. so it's got to stay there as a value mm -hmm. well you know i think everyone wants zero harm for their teams and their organization but we need to find a way to articulate differently to move us yes. outside it, that's right and, and the other one, of course, is rules focus. I mean, we talked a lot about systems being the easy space to stay. Um, what is it about the rules focus that we need to be mind, mindful of? I think that, that rules will only, you know, the conformance to rules approach will only get you a certain level of, of, of cultural maturity because the rules themselves then become the be all and end all. Yeah. And people then will, and lots of people I'm sure have heard this before, people then just blindly follow the rule yeah. without recognizing. Why? What? What's the purpose of the rule? No, at a procedural level or a rule level, the rules are only ever a, 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 a an ideal representation of what mm. work should look like. Yeah. In reality, work never looks like that when it's been when it's been done in the field or in its active sense, yeah. and, and therefore, absolutely trying to absolutely conform to the rule fails to recognise that the real world of work is is different. Mm. Um, and that's the bit that allows an organisation to grow culturally is to recognise that just by conformance, the organisation is going to reach a ceiling and is never going to transfer, to yeah. transition through. Yeah, and it can be, I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced these where we've really focused heavy on getting high levels of compliance to mm. our rules. And it gets you a certain level, because I mean, it has to, if you get the good standards and you get good rules, it's going to get you to a reasonably good level of yeah. performance. Mm. But you just start to find those little examples where it's holding you back. Yeah. You know, people just doing what they were told to do rather than actually going and seeing the bigger picture. I mean, I can, I can remember the day someone was going out to change a valve because the pipe was leaking. You know, I changed the valve, but there was actually a crack in the pipe. But that was the job they were asked to do. Yep. That was the rule. That was the procedure they were asked to go do. Mm. But when we started it back up, it was still leaking because yep. the pipe didn't get fixed. Just do what you're told just rather than think about what it is that you need to do. And that's yeah. the difference between a compliance rules-based culture and, a, and one that's that's more advanced so it's learning that it is a part of the integral model systems and rules are there yeah but you've got to look holistically at that process and not just be rules driven yeah, it's got to be a complete solution not just part of the yeah. solution and when we talk about discipline focus i mean we've all heard this before haven't we you know the old parent child relationship you know just do as you're told do as i say yeah. um you know i'm the parent or i'm the boss you're the subordinate you're the child mm -hmm. you know um, there's a certain level of comfort in that. 
again, it's back to the control process. As a leader, if I'm in a situation where I can tell you what to do, or I might need to show you as well as tell you, but then I'm confident that you're going to do what I want you to. So it's letting go of that it's authoritarian control and go to adult, adult. Yep. What does that lead to? That's, Share. That's the, the, you get the sharing, but I think you also get the, the added benefit of you know, three heads, four heads, five heads, ten heads, not just one head. You know, that we've said this before, this analogy of uh, who's doing the thinking, I'm doing all the thinking, I just need your but hands. I've got all my hands. Yeah. Actually, what you need is everybody to do the thinking because that, that, you know, that increases significantly the capability of that organisation. Yeah. And, and to do that, the leaders have got to be comfortable that they're going to lose the parent-adult-child analogy and they're going to move to you know, adult-adult processes yeah. where they're using the entire team. And this is the, yeah, you know, this is the fundamental understanding when we think about why space. It's cultural change. It's becoming holistic in how you're doing things. It's thinking about subjective and objective. Mm-hmm. It's also about doing new things, but it's also about let, letting go of some old things. Yep. All right. So let's start talking about. So what does it take to do this thing? I mean, we've talked a lot about what it is and what are some of the challenges, and we've talked a lot about. Um, you know, some things for people to connect with around what white space is and some of the challenges of that. Um, talk us a bit through this process of navigating it. So as we, I think as we said earlier, the, na- the navigation process needs, we need to have a clear understanding of what, what the path looks like, what the pathway is. So there's a bit of work at the early stages in terms of working out, well, how do we communicate that to organisations? What's the communication process look like? So we can ensure that everybody embarks on the journey together collectively yeah. and they've all got a view of the direction that, that they're going in maybe not necessarily always clear about the exact pathway because as we mentioned earlier it may need to change it may need to change depending on what what sort of hazards are, are, mm-hmm. are experienced along the way yeah we need to work out what it is we're actually going to do so that's the content development uh, process what are that what does the the new skill or the new behavior or the new the, the new way of working look like how do we and how do we sort of pack that and unpack it yeah. And then thirdly, you know, how will you actually start? So what's the schedule? What's the process? What's the process? Do we have milestones? What's what, Where do we expect to be by a certain time frames? Can we put something in place to show that we're actually on track in terms of where we expect to be? Yeah. So that sort of sets up the, 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 the journey. Yeah, so um, travellers can move. Travellers can move. As we get into the actual movement process, the early stages are in, in our sort of five C's process, which is what, what we're showing here, is about making sure that the leaders understand the context of what they're, they're about to embark on. Mm-hmm. So it's getting them ready for the change, for, for the journey, by giving them a, a, a time to, um, some time to understand what that journey means, yeah. what it means to them, what it means to the organisation. What are some of the new things we need to be doing? Yeah. Maybe what some of the old things we need to be letting go and doing it in a different way? And having a bit of time to reflect on what that might be feel like look like so, yeah. no, have, no. so, so that they get comfortable with that because the next one then leads you into the comfort stage yeah. and if leaders are not comfortable with the fact that they're having to go through a, a, a change process they won't actually embrace it and they won't actually embark on that change and it won't be successful yeah. so there's some time uh, required in the first two stages to get the leaders within the organization at, you know, at all levels mm-hmm understanding what it's about and getting comfortable with the fact that there is a that there is a change process that they're having to go through. It's about actually putting in an approach that helps people step into the white space yep. where it's uncertain, it's uncomfortable, loss of control, yep. but it's safe to go there because someone's there to support you through it. Hmm. It's, it's having the guide that takes you into the white space rather than having somebody just push you in yeah. and allow you to float around freely without really any understanding about what it is that you're doing or yeah. why, you, why you're even there. Because as people become more comfortable with that and they're going to start shifting into the learning stage, that's all about their level of confidence. Yeah. And the confidence bit is often where um, people think the change process starts. I've got, some, I've got to acquire some new skills on new student behaviour. It's like you get my sleeves rolled up and start straight away. Again, as we mentioned earlier, there is a likelihood that individuals will fail yeah. and, f- and fail fairly early in that process. What does that do to their confidence? What does that do to that confidence? Their confidence dies straight away. But if, you've, if we've spent the time with them providing context and comfort and that they realise that there is a likelihood of them failing early, yep. they're more comfortable with that process of failure in the confidence building process and therefore actually doesn't have the same level of negative impact on their confidence. It's yep. part of the learning journey. Yep. So when they do fail, the confidence doesn't drop. That's a part of the process. Yep. The 
confidence sessions may increase because I've just learned something from yeah, that. They're now better than they were before they had that failure because they now understand what doesn't work, but also what with a small change mm-hmm. can work. Because once we've gone through that increase in comfort and confidence, then we can really accelerate their competency. Yes, and that's where, you know, again, that's where you get into this exponential activity where they, they build on their, their ability to be able to operate in this new world with their new skills and new competencies much faster because we've put the time investment in with the previous stages to build the right platform and the right foundation. Yeah, and you know, when people be, are comfortable and confident in that new level of competency, that gives us consistency and change. Yeah. That means we're likely to stay outside in that growth path. It, it, it's, it's the stickability of the process. It means that you're actually less likely to be drawn backwards mm-hmm. into old habits. Yeah. The consistency bit allows them to form new habits yeah. and the habits are more aligned to the high level of cultural maturity. Yeah. So you can see, just to navigate white space, you've actually got to put a lot of thought yeah. into how do we actually help individuals go through the process of change. Mm. If we just set an expectation and let everyone go, some may do it, most won't. Most won't. That's, that's the route to chaos. Yeah. And, and we've heard that so many times when it comes to, oh, we've just run everybody through a leadership workshop and we magically think they're going to be great new leaders. The sheep dip approach does not work. No. Um, all that happens is people get wet yeah. and, and eventually they'll dry out yeah. and they're exactly the same as they were before they got wet. Yeah. Um, and just constantly sheep dipping people, it's just a lot of, a lot of waste of, of dampness. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of money, and yeah. it's a lot of effort, mm. for very little change. Yeah. Um, it's while you've got to do an element of that up front, but it's realizing what that actually is. Mm. It's actually context. Yeah. It's all it is. Mm. It's giving people some context to what you're expecting, some context around what you want leadership to be and how you want them to lead. It's what you do after that that matters. Yeah. And I, it, I think it, it's recognizing that you know, this journey is a it has got a time factor to it. It's not something that you can do in the space of a few weeks or even a few months. There's a there's an element of time investment here to get people through these five stages yeah. so that they can actually be operate at a new level of, of cultural maturity. Because it goes back to the first point we we're talking about. You've got to actually push through the whole thing. You can't just keep circling around change. Mm-hmm. You've actually got to just have the process to push you right through. Because fundamentally, when they get into that confidence, confidence, consistency stage, that's where they're going to start experiencing some black holes. Yeah. I, I know that the hardest part of this is often the start. It, and that, that, that takeoff or the drive that you get from having a different craft mm-hmm. is, is the boost that you need to get through the, the, the resistors at the early stages, which we covered a little bit earlier, and get into the stages of context, comfort, and confidence. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's, that's what I think hopefully people are getting from this session is understanding that that is the reality of change there's this white space that people are going to be uncomfortable with you've got to be able to define where you want them to be so they actually understand that while i step out into this unknown area this uncertain area it's leading to a path like it's leading to another space um, but give them the right structure to get through it. Yeah. It, it. People need to know that there's a purpose and that the, what's that purpose look like mm-hmm. and where are we trying to get to? Yeah. All right, so let's start getting into the summary. So this hopefully helps everyone piece a lot of that discussion together. So the first thing you're probably hearing from us is white space is about the unknown. You know, mm-hmm. It's about the uncomfortable area of change. Yeah. And, and I think the, the bit that's interesting for me with that is it is about the unknown it's, and it's certainly about the uncomfortable. Mm. But when you actually get into the white space, some of the things that you will experience in that are actually not quite as unknown as you think they are. Yeah. It's just that as you enter, you can't see them mm. because you're not quite sure when and where they're going to appear. In that situation, in that change, situation. you're not quite sure exactly what you're going to encounter. That's right. So the second one then is recognizing white space. So just recognizing some of those things. So the uncomfortability, the uncertainty, the loss of control, the different sort of attributes you're going to be working through. Mm-hmm. So you know when you're encountering it. Yep. Right. You, it, it's it's a given as you go through this journey that you will be in situations where you you're going to have to transition through these white space issues. Yep. And, and just actually knowing that that's part of the journey can in itself give you a greater chance of being successful. White space can be encountered by both the individual and the organisation or the collective. Yep. It's 
I think every every significant culture change process that organisations go through, individuals and the organisation will experience their own types of white space and their own elements of white space. Yeah. Thinking that, that the organisation is not going to have uh, have to tackle white space is probably not uh, is not going to be successful either. Yeah. And these last two for me, I think. Are probably the biggest points here I think we need to understand is to actually get through white space, there's got to be a supportive process to that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if we mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, you know, part of this is recognising that there is a high potential for individuals to fail. You can't be comfortable to fail in an environment which isn't supportive. For failure. And if you don't generate the supportive environment, individuals will fail once. They'll see that that actually isn't helpful and that they're not getting the support that they want and they'll stop and therefore you won't make the journey. Yeah. And just on the failure bit, how does that work when it comes to, I mean, when we're talking about executing work safely mm. and not having fatalities or serious injuries, so, you know, how, just quickly, how does an organisation or individuals negotiate the fact that we still need to allow some level of failure in there without necessarily overreacting to situations. Uh, it, there's, there's clearly, a, there's still the risk process that sits alongside that, yeah. so we're not, you know, the, the, this isn't about throwing risk management out the window and saying it's not something that has to take place anymore. It's about recognizing that in, in the cultural change process, particularly from, it, this is, it, particularly from a behavior and, and a sort of uh, uh, thoughts, actions and behaviors point of view, there are some things that need to change, and in that change process, there's a likelihood or the potential that the outcome of that change will not be what is expected. Yeah. So it's about trying to foresee what those unexpected outcomes could be, yeah. and putting in elements of mitigation to allow those to be managed should they happen. So when we're talking about failure, we're talking about an individual trying a new yeah, it's skill, skill, a new style, yeah. or a new approach that fits in a more cultural change journey. Mm -hmm. Even within the safety execution space, there's still an element of being able to change, hmm. which may lead to failure. But it's knowing that if you've got multiple layers of control, you might want to try playing with one of those controls to see if you can make them more effective. Because the failure of that one control should not lead to a significant outcome. No, if your system's set up properly, yeah. you know, there are barriers in place to stop that single yeah. failure from leading to a significant failure. But I'm just hoping that answers a couple of questions. People go, oh, hang on a minute, we can't have failure in safety because people die. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. But there's elements in there where you can still safely navigate change mm -hmm. and new ways of doing things and get an element of failure in there because we learn from failure as, as the way we go and through. And I think we, you know, the focus here is about you know, leaders and getting leaders to become better leaders. So what, mm -hmm. we, what we're aiming is to improve the leader capability, the leader skill level, the, lead, yeah. the, the ability for the leader to become a better leader. Yeah. So that's more in terms of their behaviours and their, their actions and their thoughts rather than a lot of physicality. We're physicality not, of actually controlling the hazard. We're not talking, okay. we're not spending a lot of time in changing the way that the, the organisation addresses their physical hazards. This is more about the, the leader's ability to be able to lead in a better yeah. way. And the last one then is to navigate through white space requires actual active coaching. It's not a journey that individuals can be successful in if they actually don't have a support and a guide and a coach to take them through. Yeah. You know, back to the sort of conversation earlier about they may be good at mining, they may be good at construction, they may be good at, at hospitality. hospitality, but they may not necessarily have the capability to be able to guide a lot of leaders through a change process at the same time. So they need to ensure that they, they engage with the right people to do that. Yeah. So to sum it up, every time we go through change or we've grown or we've moved into a new cultural maturity stage, we've navigated white space. Yeah. This, the depth and the, thick, the, the, the sort of spread of that might be different depending on what the change or the growth process uh, the individual is going through is. But every time we go through that, we're going through our own version of what of white space. Right. All right. Well, look, we've covered our discussion just around the white space. So I'm happy to just throw, we've only got a couple of people on, which is probably a good opportunity to get some more personalised questions in here but has anyone got any questions for us before we start wrap, wrapping up yeah really good question I, I, while we've spoken about lots of different things that help us navigate white space from your point tony is there one thing that you think has the biggest impact on being able to move our way through it i, I think it's it's 
for me it's, it's recognizing that that is a distinct element of the change process so actually just accepting the fact that I'm moving into a situation where I don't have control and I may not necessarily understand everything that I'm, exper- that I'm going to experience. And some people may fail in that process. Yes, they, they may not even get off that. So for me, I would say it's that it's that transition between context, comfort and confidence is the most important part for people to start embracing. If you're going to help your organisation shift culture maturity, you need to find a way and you need to sort out the process of how we support each other mm. in those initial stages of change or we'll go straight back to our comfort zone. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Good question, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Well, look, thanks everyone for your time. Um, really appreciate you coming on and if you didn't get a chance, for those who are watching the recording, if you didn't get a chance to come on to our live one, um, look forward to seeing you on one, one of our next ones and uh, look forward to talking to you all soon. Okay. See you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye.